Welcome to the seminar series on sewer and pipeline engineering. My name is Bert Bossela. I am the scientific director of the IKT, Institute for Underground Infrastructure. And in this seminar session, we are going to deal with the rehabilitation of sewers and pipelines. And first, we want to look at the objectives and tasks of a rehabilitation. Well, actually, it seems obvious why we have to rehabilitate our sewer and pipe system. Many of the damages to our underground sewers and pipes are already showing effects on the surface, so that the road surface is also damaged. Leaks, for example, wash soil into the pipes and at the surface we see holes in the road, as shown in the pictures on the right. And also, many manholes are damaged, like on the picture in the middle below. Some manhole covers have sunk, others protrude from the street level. Sewers, pipes and manholes, therefore, need to be maintained. And this is what we want to talk about now. First of all, we want to ask, what are the fundamental objectives of the rehabilitation? For example, what is stated in the standards and what are the particular requirements? Then we want to ask ourselves how we can assess the condition of the sewers and pipelines. And finally, we will look at typical practical rehabilitation tasks. So, let's start with the rehabilitation objectives. What does it say in the standards? What terms are defined there with regard to rehabilitation? Well, with regard to terminology, there are three main technical standards on European and international level. Very generally, the terms of maintenance are defined at European level in EN 13306. However, this standard is not so much about technical content, but more about questions of maintenance strategy. Internationally, the term rehabilitation is defined in ISO 24516 for the water supply and sanitation sector. There, rehabilitation is already divided into the method groups of replacement, renovation and repair. However, basically, all terms refer to the European standard EN 16323. The, this standard is of outstanding importance. Even though the title of the standard only refers to wastewater terms, it will be used for the entire water sector in the future through the references from ISO 24516. The definitions of the individual re rehabilitation methods are then as shown in this picture. Repair is defined as the rectification of local damage. The asset, which is the sewer section between two manholes, therefore remains basically unchanged. Only a local defect is repaired. Renovation is then defined as work incorporating all or part of the original fabric of the drain or sewer by means of which its current performance is improved. Well, I think we have to digest that first. And by replacement we mean the construction of a new drain or sewer on or off the line of an existing drain or sewer. The function of the new drain or sewer incorporating that of the old. In short, the new drain or sewer is being built to replace the old one. We see the definitions of repair and replacement seem quite clear. The term renovation, on the other hand, is defined somewhat oddly. So what is it really about? Well, with regard to the current year's budget, repair and replacement have some disadvantages. After all, a repair only restores the original condition, so it is purely an operational measure. The sewage asset is not changed in principle, so this operational measure must be financed by the fees of the current year. In contrast, a replacement is of course an investment, so the expenditure can be co-financed by the fees for the next years, since the new line will also be used by future fee payers. However, in replacement, the old pipe will be abandoned. And if this old pipe still had a book well value, then we get a special depreciation that must be immediately compensated for, either by the current fees or by taxes. Well, now, by defining the term of renovation, an attempt is made to escape these two dilemmas. On the one hand, the old substance is used further. 
That means it is included in the renovation. Therefore, there is no special depreciation in the accountant's books. On the other hand, the condition of the entire pipeline is improved in such a way that its useful life can be considerably extended. And then the whole thing can be considered an investment. That means the construction costs can be refinanced also with future fees. We can see some seemingly technical definitions often have a significant commercial background or commercial objectives at least. But what is the expected performance of a rehabilitation according to the standard? How good must the quality of a rehabilitation be? Here the EN 752 standard clearly defines, in principle, the performance requirements for a rehabilitated system shall be the same as those for a new system. This means that rehabilitation is expected to meet the same requirements as new systems. A rehabilitation is therefore not only a remedy but a real restoration of technical perfect conditions. And what this means in detail, we all remember from the construction of new pipes and sewers. We have already distinguished three main performance characteristics. Number one, operational safety or reliability. Number two, structural safety or stability. And then of course, tightness. And now apparently these criteria apply not only to new sewers, but also to rehabilitation. A rehabilitated sewer must also be reliable, structural safe and tight. And just like a new sewer for the whole intended service life at reasonable cost and in compliance with all legal requirements. So we see all those high demands are also made for rehabilitation. And if we take a closer look at stability, we recall the typical statics of a pipe laid in a trench. Most of the old sewers and pipes that we have to rehabilitate today were laid in this way. If the stability of the system is now compromised in the case of damage, then for rehabilitation we must also demand that a defined structural calculable system is created again. If the pipe is broken, this means, for example, that the lost stiffness of the pipe soil system has to be restored or even be improved by appropriate stiffening measures in the soil or in the pipe. And in the same way, defined requirements are also made on the tightness of sewers and pipes. These requirements must then also be fulfilled after a rehabilitation measure. A leak test, as shown here in the picture, is therefore also useful and common after rehabilitation. In the case of repair measures, however, this can be very difficult since repair is by definition a local improvement and the leak test of only one local point can be more complex than testing the entire section. But besides the leak test, there are of course many other methods for assessing the condition of defective and also rehabilitated sewers. So let's take a look at these methods now. The simplest way of condition assessment is of course to wait until it is too late. If the road collapses, we will certainly know that there is a stability problem with the sewer. If there is backwater flooding the basement with sewage, then operational safety is definitely no longer guaranteed and water pollution can also show the failure of the system. But of course we don't want all that to happen. We want to prevent precisely such damaging effects by identifying the poor condition of a sewer in good time, before it is too late. So what kind of techniques can we use to detect even smaller defects before the sewer fails? The most common technique is camera inspection. A CCTV carriage system is inserted in the manhole and then travels through the sewer. The camera mounted on the carriage can usually be swiveled and can record the surface of the sewer from different perspectives. Damage can thus be easily detected. Here we see an overview of cameras used to inspect sewers. There is a variety of techniques and a high speed of innovation. The quality and possible applications are constantly improving. In this picture from an old textbook, we see the principle again. The optical inspection with CCTV camera is indeed the classic among inspection methods.
but larger sewers can also be inspected directly. Here we see pictures of a survey of the sewer and also the inspection by means of a camera. In another seminar session we have already talked in detail about measuring the inner diameter of the pipe to determine the deformation of plastic pipes. There are of course limits to visual inspection and especially to inspection by walk-in. Large interceptors are filled with wastewater all the time. So if inspections are to be carried out during operation, special safety measures are required. As a rule, specialists are commissioned with the inspection here. And there are also many large main sewers that have never been inspected because they are constantly filled. The special thing about optical inspection is that we as humans can directly interpret the light reflection of the inspection lamps because normal light belongs to the electromagnetic wave range that we can see. But the spectrum of electromagnetic waves is much wider. We can of course also use other wave ranges, but then we need geophysical analysis methods to evaluate the results. A typical geophysical measurement method that uses electromagnetic waves is radar. Radar can penetrate the pipe wall and also penetrate the ground. However, this electromagnetic wave is reflected by water, so the method cannot be used in groundwater. We see another mechanical method in the two pictures below, seismics. Here, mechanical shock waves are excited and geophones are used to record the transmission or the reflection in the underground. The results can then be used to create tomographic images of the subsurface. In the example here, the red areas represent particularly solid, rapidly transmissive areas. The blue areas, on the other hand, have been passed through more slowly and are therefore probably much softer. To validate the results, soil samples should always be taken from representative locations. A further mechanical measurement method is the MAC system. MAC or MAC stands for Mechanical Assessment of Conduits. In this method, the pipe is slightly pressed outwards with a pressure cylinder. This, of course, without damaging the pipe, and the force deformation relationship is then measured. The deformation is recorded directly at the cylinder and at a certain distance in front of and behind it. The pipe stiffness and the soil stiffness can then be determined from these data. If we then identify weaknesses in the system, we can assign them to the pipe or to the soil. And this then facilitates the selection of suitable rehabilitation methods, for example, a grouting of the soil or a lining of the pipe. Typical results of a MAC measurement are shown here. On the horizontal axis, the length of the sewer is plotted. Vertically, we see the measured total stiffness of the pipe soil system. The lower red curve shows the situation at the first inspection. There are clear variations in the measurement results and at meter 57 and meter 70 we see real weak points. Subsequently, the sewer was first rehabilitated with an injection and measured again using MAC. The result is the green line. The whole thing looks much better, but at meter 28 there was no effect from the injection. Obviously, a defect in the sewer wall and not in the soil was the problem here. The rehabilitation was therefore continued with a lining. The blue line then shows the total stiffness after lining the entire sewer section. Now large stiffnesses are measurable in all areas. The sewer is therefore stable again over its entire length. In this picture, we see the MAC measuring system for use in a smaller masonry egg profile. The system works semi-automatically and the data is transmitted via a radio link. The subsequent data analysis is of particular importance. The finite element method can be used to make far-reaching statements about the stability of the system before and after rehabilitation. In addition, there are also measuring systems to precisely determine the geometry of the manhole. This can be interesting, for example, if there has already been a loss of wall thickness due to corrosion. 
This data is quite important for the preparation of any refurbishment. But what damage do we typically find in our sewers? Here we see an overview from a survey by the DWA, the German Wastewater Association. Many, mainly large network operators, participated in the survey. The results show that the most common type of damage is the defective connection, as is illustrated by the pictures on the right. Obviously, the lateral sewers were rarely connected properly in the past. Other common types of damage are defects at pipe joints, cracks and obstructions, such as root ingrowth, for example. Damaged surface, including corrosion and wear, is significant at 10%, but it is not a dominant damage pattern. Typical examples of CCTV inspection results can be seen in this picture. Without much effort, we can immediately see that something is wrong here. And now we want to take a closer look from an engineering perspective. What is actually wrong here? According to what criteria do we want to evaluate this? Or to put it in another way, what is the actual rehabilitation task? And that brings us to the third point in our seminar session today, the rehabilitation task. And we already know, after rehabilitation, the same requirements are set for the sewers and pipes as for a new sewer. The sewers must be operationally safe, stable and watertight. Accordingly, this means that when assessing damage, we must always ask ourselves what influence damage has on these three criteria. Only when we know this do we know what the concrete rehabilitation task is and thus which rehabilitation method might come into question. Do we need a method that improves the stability or rather one that seals the pipeline section? Or do we need to improve the flow so that the hydraulic capacity is re-established? And with this objective in mind, let's now take a detailed look at our damage examples. And let us ask ourselves, what do these damage scenarios mean for operational safety, stability and tightness? And not only for the present time, but of course, over the entire service life. In this picture, this seems very simple. We can see clearly the sewer has collapsed. So the assessment here is obvious, nothing works here anymore. The sewer is not operationally safe, because in principle this is a blockage or at least a major obstacle. And the sewer is obviously not stable either, quite the opposite. Of course, the sewer is also leaking to a great extent, the ground is even collapsing. A rehabilitation method would therefore have to achieve a great deal here. Stability, tightness and operational safety would have to be restored. And it is probably not only the pipe that is damaged, but also the soil. Actually, we have to restore the entire pipe soil system. This means that only the only thing left to do is to dig up the pipe and lay it again. So that was easy, but what about this damage scenario? We see a vitrified clay pipe and obviously something has hit the wall from inside or outside. On the left we can see into the pipe wall and we also see fine longitudinal cracks at 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock and also at 10 o'clock. And on the right we can see another long transverse crack from the top to the bottom. The inner pipe wall is clearly visible. But how are we going to assess this picture now? Operational safety, stability, tightness, what is the situation? Well, let's start with the tightness. There are many open cracks, so the pipe is obviously leaking. And how do we assess stability? Well, that's where it gets more difficult. We don't see any major deformations, but the cracks don't look good. At least in the long run, soil could also break in and then the whole thing would become unstable. Finally, there's the question of operational safety. Well, in the hydraulic aspect, it doesn't look too bad. The gradient seems to be okay. The cross-section is also still completely free of obstructions. The only problems are the open edges, where solids could get caught and form obstacles. But what does all this mean for the rehabilitation? Obviously, the priority here is we have to seal. We have to stabilize the whole thing so that no more soil penetrates and we should also cover the edges in such a way that they won't become a problem for the water flow. 
So lining from the inside is certainly a good option here. This will make the pipe tight again and it would also prevent soil penetration. So it is not really necessary to dig up and make a new pipe soil system here. So let's move on to the next picture. This is a real classic in sewer rehabilitation. Obviously the vertical loads were too high. A pipe made of vitrified clay or concrete then typically breaks with four longitudinal cracks. The first crack occurring in the invert and then immediately followed by the crack in the crown and the cracks at the sides in the so-called springline area. At the top and bottom the cracks open up very much on the inside because the whole thing is moving downwards. On the sides we only see a narrow fracture line. Here the pipes move outwards and thus the cracks also open on the outside of the pipe while they are compressed on the inside. So when we look for such damage we have to look primarily at the bottom of the pipe or if the bottom of the pipe is filled with water or dirt then just at the crown. But let's get back to the assessment. That means tightness, operational safety and stability. First of all tightness. Yes, obviously the, the pipe is leaking, we have large cracks. Then operational safety. In this case too it actually looks quite good hydraulic, hydraulically. The pipe is hardly deformed, the cross section is almost unchanged, everything can continue to flow off well here. However, there may be water losses because after all we have a large crack at the bottom. Now we come to the stability, what about that? Well, basically you have to say that a pipe that has these four typical cracks actually only consists of four large segments and is no longer a real pipe at all. Without the supporting soil on the sides, the whole thing simply collapses. So the soil has a special role to play. As with a flexible pipe, the soil supports the sides and acts like a bedding spring. It is a question, however, how long this will work. In any case, no soil may enter through the cracks and the bedding must be preserved over the whole service life. So we see here too, sealing and stabilizing the situation over the entire service life is what we needed. Here too, we could for example line the pipe with a CIPP liner to seal it and to prevent soil intrusion. Let's move on to another example. What can we see here? An elliptical line, a contour and the inspector's remark at the top left, Verformung, deformation, it says in German. The pipe is clearly deformable and dark. Specifically, it is a plastic pipe made of polyethylene, that is HDPE. We can also tell that it is probably PE from the fact that the pipe joint has obviously been made as a welded joint. The white ring is nothing other than the weld seam that reflects the camera light. And polyolefins and especially PE can be welded. PVC joints on the other hand cannot be welded and must be stuck or glued. Either way the pipe is deformed. In structural design deformations are admitted and are even expected in order to cause a lateral bedding reaction. However, we usually calculate with a maximum of 4 to 6 percent deformation over the entire service life. Here, however, the deformations are probably much higher, more like 15 to 20 percent, and that is far beyond the requirements of the structural analysis. So how do we interpret this now? What does this mean for stability? Well, the pipe is still only deformed and has not collapsed. But it does not seem to be safe in the long run, that means stable. Unfortunately, it is almost impossible to calculate the stability of such a pipe afterwards, because the material is viscoelastic, so because of relaxation, we don't know which stresses are really present in the pipe and which are already relaxed. Basically, you first have to estimate whether the situation is continuously deteriorating or if it has reached equilibrium. If the whole thing was only installation errors, then the situation is perhaps stable. In that case, it may be sufficient to inspect the pipe at shorter intervals in the future. 
and only intervene if new deformations occur. But let's look also at operational safety. Of course, severe deformations also change the cross-section. However, up to 10% deformations, one can say that what is missing at the top is added to the sides. With large deformations, of course, this no longer works because if the pipe gets down to the bottom, nothing will pass through. Nevertheless, the loss of cross-section is probably not so tragic here. More critical is the question of how the pipes behave in the longitudinal direction. If something was done wrong during installation, then this probably also applies to the quality of the gradient. That means we have to reckon with underbands or even counter gradients. And what about tightness? Well, with regard to tightness, welded plastic pipes are usually not so critical. And even plug joints are basically watertight in the case of minor deformations. Ultimately, however, only a leak test can provide a reliable statement. Next example. Here we see roots that have grown into the pipe. The first thing to note is that the roots are obviously growing in through a lateral connection. That means the main pipe is probably completely undamaged. The connecting pipe itself is probably no longer in use at all. All in all, the whole thing is a great danger to operational safety. The roots take up a lot of space and block almost a quarter of the cross-section. In addition, they are an obstacle on which other solids can also get caught. So there are substantial risks of clogging. A short-term remedy can be to mill off the roots with a milling robot. But the roots will grow back and then the whole thing starts all over again. Permanent rehabilitation is only possible if we tackle the connection line. Of course, this is not very easy because often it is already on private land and the damage must then be repaired by the private owner. Or at least the expense has to be paid by him. And now our last example, which is particularly critical. Here we see how groundwater flows into the sewer system from outside through leaking pipe joints. Such unplanned infiltrations are also called extraneous water. There's always extraneous water, for example, when surface water enters the manhole at a manhole cover, but its significance depends on the quantity. Such jets of water, as we see here, can quickly lead to several cubic meters of extraneous water per day. And that is then more than the wastewater flowing in through a house connection. As a result, the sewer network and the sewage treatment plant can be hydraulically overloaded which means that the network backs up and the plants do not clean properly. So the operational safety is definitely in question here. But what about the stability of the pipes? Well, here the pipes seem to be in perfect condition. There are no cracks and no shards. But we are not only interested in the current stability, but also in the long-term stability over the service life. And this can be critical if soil particles are washed in with the water. In extreme cases, the bedding of the pipe is gradually washed out. At some points, the system fails and the pipes break. In addition, soil from the ground above the pipe can also be washed in. We have already seen that the road can then be damaged too. The special thing about infiltration, however, is that it is not always an unintentional damage. Here we see pipes with half joints as they were used in some networks in the 19th century. In the lower area, the water can be safely drained away and in the upper area, the socket is deliberately designed to be leaky. And this in order to provoke the infiltration of groundwater. Why are we doing this? Well, there are two reasons. Number one, groundwater infiltration simply flushes the sewer especially in the initial branches of the system, too little runoff can lead to operational problems. This includes, for example, the buildup of sediments. Here, the groundwater helps to transport the sediments away. Number two, in some areas, the groundwater level is so high that this causes problems at buildings or that water even stands on the surface. 
Here, the sewers were deliberately used as drainage systems to lower the groundwater level. Then, of course, we have to be very careful with the rehabilitation. If we see at such sewers, then the groundwater level may rise again to a level that causes damage to buildings. Let me illustrate this problem with another example. In this situation, the groundwater level has dropped due to a leaking main sewer. The basement rooms are clearly above the groundwater level. So, what happens if we seal, that means if we now rehabilitate the main sewer with a CIPP liner, for example? Well, the groundwater can no longer drain through the main sewer and the groundwater level rises. What is interesting now is what the red house connection pipe is doing, which lies in the groundwater. If we have damage here, as in this picture, then the groundwater flows back into the main sewer via the house connection pipe. Here's an example of such a situation. So we have to seal the house connection pipe as well if we want to safely protect the sewer system from groundwater infiltration. In addition to defective connection pipes, building drains can also lead groundwater into the sewer. Such drainage systems date back to the construction period of the building, for example. They serve to keep the excavation pit dry during construction. Other drainage systems are intended to collect the water that seeps into the building area during rainfall and drain it away to non-critical areas. Actually, these drainage systems are not supposed to release groundwater into the sewer system during normal operation. In practice, however, this is often the case and these drainage systems lower the groundwater level. If such drainage systems are now disconnected, however, this can in turn endanger the building again. If groundwater inflow is a problem, it is advisable to first determine which areas of the system are carrying particularly large amounts of groundwater. These should be rehabilitated first. In the picture above right, we see a typical flow measurement to identify such areas. Then, of course, the consequences of rehabilitation for the groundwater level must also be assessed. If building damage is a concern, then alternative drainage systems must be provided to regulate the groundwater level. But groundwater is not the only kind of unwanted water in the sewer system. In the separate system, rainwater misconnections can also lead to problems. In order to find these faulty connections, fog or smoke, for example, is introduced into the wastewater sewer. On the left picture, we see this fog coming out of a rainwater downpipe. Obviously, this is a faulty connection. In some places, not only rainwater downpipes, but also small water bodies were connected directly to the sewer. This has a similar effect to the connection of groundwater drains. Drains, there is a continuous inflow of extraneous water. Well, and finally, the question remains, what will the rehabilitation of the sewers cost? Here we see the results of a survey of investment plans of the network operators in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany for an area with 18 million inhabitants. Here, a total annual volume for investments in the sewer system of about 1 billion euros is expected. This amount is divided equally between new construction and rehabilitation. And this brings me to the end of this seminar session. We have seen that the rehabilitation objectives are very high. We expect the same performance after rehabilitation as for a new structure. And that concerns stability, tightness and operational safety. And all three criteria over the entire remaining service life. With this in mind, we have first to assess the condition of the sewers and pipes. Sewers, for example, are regularly inspected with cameras and the camera recordings are then evaluated. We have seen from examples that there are many different types of damage and rehabilitation tasks and that we must always keep an eye on the entire pipe soil system and also the groundwater. Thank you.